hi out there. Can't really tell who you are, how many of you uh, are out there, but it sounds like a lot. Um, raise your hand if you've heard of no code. Okay, squinting, I see, I see some hands, okay. It's definitely an improvement since 2012 when we started the company. Um, but before I go into to no code and how it's going to allow AI to be more broadly uh, experienced by, by, um, by the enterprise uh, and, and small business uh, knowledge workforce, um, I want to start with a, a, a small shout out to Weights and Biases. I actually started my career in 2009 as an intern at uh, Lucas and, and Chris Van Pelt's uh, previous company, Crowdflower. So uh, very full circle that uh, you know, we're, we're all back here now at this moment. Um, and I think it's, it's been interesting for me to watch AI really take off over the, the recent past. Um, I started my, my, uh, my college experience being very interested in AI and, and at the time neural networks, uh, tooled around a lot in MATLAB and was trying to find some interesting applications of, of uh, in that case, neural nets. And ultimately, I decided my time would be better spent at that time learning UX because the, the constant for me at, at, at the time was, okay, you can build all of this advanced inference, you can do interesting stuff with that, you need high quality data, you can get some really interesting outputs, but to wrap it all up into an experience that people are gonna be able to use and, and get value from, we're still gonna need the principles of, of UX, right? Um, whether that's with a natural language input or through GUIs, you know, understanding UX and really how humans can interface with a computer is gonna be the, the universal language, the constant of how software experiences are realized more broadly. and so. That's how we started Airtable in 2012. Uh, we were really you know, going out with this mission of democratizing the building of useful apps. And to do so with a no-code paradigm, which at the time was not very well understood, I mean, arguably, um, you know, really not, not a category. And today, you know, I think what we've done is taken all of the principles of building apps. So you have a data layer, you have logic, you have interface, and we've distilled them into a form where you can just drag and drop it, sort of like what you do with a Squarespace or a Wix for websites, Airtable is to, to apps. Now, how does this all tie into AI? We'll get to that. Um, I think the most exciting thing to me, looking at AI, and especially Gen AI today, versus where the state of the art was in 2009 when I graduated, is that now, out of the box, you have these incredible foundation models, um, and specifically for me, LLMs are the really exciting thing, uh, that are capable of being applied to a really broad range of knowledge work. So no longer do you have to go and have a really large and high quality data set that you can then train your own model on and then you know, only after a lot of effort can you do some useful inference uh, applications. But instead now, as we've all experienced from ChatGPT and you, know, you can do funny and silly things with it, um, but you can also do quite advanced things, right? Um, and I think that's the part that has most piqued my interest as a technologist and somebody who loves thinking about how do you take really powerful technology and productize it into a way that anyone can use, that more people can get value from. It's basically what we did with the foundations of Airtable, taking the concept of database-powered applications and democratizing it into this no-code GUI experience. And it's what we're now setting out to do uh, with AI and the, the power of Gen AI and especially LLMs. Um, now this talk is not just about Airtable. What I want to leave you with are four principles of how to build great UX around LLMs that make them more immediately uh, valuable to real use cases and real people, especially within a workplace setting. Um, one final thought on, on the, uh, the current um, you know, point in time that we're in, I think what's really blown me away is that as you've, you've watched these models progress over the, even the, the recent past, the breakthroughs in terms of what they're able to do. You know, it's not just about um, you know, being able to stylistically edit content or summarize, et cetera, but I think a lot of people over-gravitate on these more narrow, and I would say um, you know, less reasoning or creativity or knowledge-heavy uh, prompts. But in fact, the, the, you know, the, the reality is that if you go in and you really push um, these models to their limits, they're capable of much more. I mean, dare I say it, even strategy. Um, if you think of yourself as a you know, product manager or somebody working on a, on a new feature, to actually go in and be able to get a, um, a LLM to give you a very useful starting point is really magical. And I think that we will only unlock more of these use cases throughout the world, throughout the, you know, the, the, um, the outer reaches of every company by giving the tools to end users who are closest to their own work, closest to the data 
that they can use to apply into these LLMs to be able to really explore the edges of what's possible. Um, some of the screenshots here are from the, uh, you know, the, uh, some of the recent news pieces that we've, we've probably all seen. You know, um, foundation models being able to you know, pass the bar, being able to now um, you know, pass job interviews. And, uh, and of course, I think we've all seen the, um, the Microsoft research uh, paper that talks about the, the sparks of really incredible um, and, and, uh, and thought-provoking you know, um, signs of general intelligence that we've seen from you know, especially uh, the really large LLMs like GPT-4. Um, so of course, you know, as I said, the, the, the real bottleneck to adoption, as we believe it at, at our table and, and uh, you know, within the no-code community, is not actually at this point just the capabilities of the models themselves. And of course, there's going to be a lot of value in the innovation of you know, coming up with better foundation models, models with uh, multimodal capabilities, fine-tuning models. You know, it's really exciting to see the explosion of, of, uh, of progress there at that layer. Um, but my personal conviction is that even if you froze in this moment in time, the current capabilities of the LLMs that are out there or that you can train yourself or fine-tune yourself, there's a lot more applications for these LLMs and what they can do, especially within an enterprise context that are just screaming to be explored and deployed, but lack a vehicle to do so. And that's where we think no-code comes in. So to just give a quick example of what a no-code experience looks like, this is Airtable. Um, this is how you would build a very simple inventory management app. You have a data layer. You've got this interface layer, and you can publish it. Um, all very, very easy, no code required. Um, at the same time, if you want to extend it with more capabilities, you can go in and do so. And if we think about the, the broad range of you know, applications that you might want to build with LLMs, I think there's some that are going to be solved by functional point solutions. So you know, for sales-related workflows, there's tools out there like Salesforce or Gong or Outreach.io that uh, are already and are surely going to build more specific LLM-powered solutions, such as automatically generating emails for outbound reps, you know, so we can all get even more customized uh, and incessant uh, outbound messages uh, in our inbox. Um, but I think that if you, if you really tally up the broad range of work that the, all of the knowledge workers out there in the world are doing, only a very narrow subset of that falls into what can be applied within the context of an existing point solution. Of course, you know, the, the, you know, there's a next category of, you know, as many of you here are already working on, building custom apps on top of LLMs, right? And of course, there's going to be a lot of great innovation in terms of the, the entire stack to make it easier to build you know, fine-tuned models, to go and build the, the apps on top of it for observability on that, for chaining, et cetera. And I think that's all really, really good overall for the world and, and for innovation. And yet, I think that the broader landscape of what LLMs could be applied to can only be solved by a no-code platform. I don't think it's going to be solved by just chat-based experiences that aren't embedded into real data, into real workflows, and have a different UX than just you know, chat-style interaction. And so if you think about all of the different applications that could be built, if you know, the, the, uh, the app developers in this room were all replicated by a million times, how many more apps would we build, even for the small and even seemingly trivial use cases within companies and even some outside of companies within you know, the consumer world? So, um, really, there, there's just this broad landscape of applicability for LLMs that have not yet been exploited because of the, the difficulty, the massive friction and the cost of, of actually going and building those apps. Now, um, this isn't just about Airtable. This is really about the, the design concepts that make it easier and faster to build those apps and, and actually enable real value to be both validated and then deployed into the real enterprise applications uh, or enterprise use cases um, that are waiting to, to, uh, to see AI transformation. The first is, you know, I think this is a, a pretty straightforward one, you know, embedding into first-party data and workflows is a really crucial way of unlocking value out of these LLMs. So, you know, again, going back to 2009 and, and kind of the, uh, you know, pre-ImageNet, pre-AI Renaissance uh, era, you know, I thought of, AI and, and really specifically neural nets as 
kind of this, this way that you could generate almost like a, a very advanced form of polynomial regression, right? You could do uh, inference and, and um, you know, it was very useful, but in a very narrowly applicable sense. You have to have all this data, you have to train it, and then you, you, you get these outputs that you apply in very narrow contexts, like, you know, the Netflix Data Science Prize generate better recommendations for movies. But I think for me, what's been really, really mind-boggling about the current uh, class of Gen AI models is that out of the box, without any additional fine-tuning even, and of course you can get even more gains if you do fine-tune, you can apply it to a really broad range of work. And the key to unlocking a lot of that value is to embed that model into the place of that work, into small-scale data. So you don't have to go and actually train it yourself. You're not even fine-tuning it, but you're just embedding it. Think about like a, you know, a spreadsheet use case where every field in, or every cell inside the spreadsheet can actually reference you know, a large language model and take as inputs any data from the rest of that table and get out, whether it's a small data transformation or something much more advanced and strategic, like generate me a product requirement stock for a new feature based on some of these inputs, which could include user feedback or you know, requirements or information about this, this feature. Um, and so really that embedding into local and small scale data actually unlocks a ton of value from these LLMs. Um, I think the second is also really crucial and something that no code does very well, which is if you make the output very visible and interactive, all of a sudden you get past a lot of the challenges of hallucinations, of you know, accuracy problems, right? Because there's a ton of use cases where the LLM is gonna generate output that may not be right 100% of the time, but even when it's wrong, it's usefully wrong, meaning you know, a starting point for in that product requirements document or a marketing campaign concept, um, you know, the starting point doesn't have to be right. And in fact, sometimes having even a bad starting point, I mean, we actually internally at Airtable sometimes talk about, let's generate with humans a bad starting point so that we normalize the act of taking a first draft and revising it, reacting to it. And so if AI is your thought partner that can actually go and generate even a bad first draft of something really strategic and useful that you can react to, there's so many more applications that are unlocked than when you're trying to apply it only to those domains where it has to be right and it has to be right silently without human intervention and without a very usable, editable way to take that output and do something with it. The third is, of course, um, chainability and composability. And of course, you know, as developers, I think we've probably all used LangChain, seen it, you know, uh, and understand this concept as a developer. Um, but I think the, the even more powerful, in my view, opportunity is to introduce chainability not just at the development time of an application, but in fact at the runtime for the end users to experiment with. And so one of the core tenets of Airtable is that we see ourselves as this Lego kit. Every piece of that Lego kit, our fields, our formulas, the way that interface layouts work, are all composable. So when you create a field output in Airtable, you can then feed that output into any other field or to reference it in a different table or to compose it onto an interface layout however you want. And what that means is that in Airtable, our AI field implementation allows you to go and take the output of you know, an AI-generated step. So let's say you use an LLM to create a product requirements doc for a feature. You can then take that document and feed it into an automation where when a button is clicked, it, it, it gets sent out by email. Or it could be that you actually feed it into yet another step that's powered by an LLM. So take the first output step, review it with a human, and then give it to another LLM call that's able to do something else useful, like for instance, generate the marketing brief or the press release for this feature, both of which were created by AI at least um, as a starting point. And the fourth is really ride the wave of model progression. And what this means is that, you know, as we've all seen, and I think especially excitingly over the, the recent you know, past six months, I think there's just been this explosion of surprising innovation, especially in the open source world, and you know, pre-trained models um, you know, where you get the weights out of the box. And it be, it's becoming easier and easier to fine tune. Um, and I think all this means is that models are getting better. You know, they're getting cheaper. And the range of models that you can use for different applications or different domains is getting wider. And 
our, our view at Airtable is, you know, rather than try to go and compete by creating our own model, we want to build a product experience that rides on top of all of the models. So, you know, interchangeability is an important tenet of how we build our product. You know, as you go and implement AI as a core concept into an Airtable app through no code, we want to make it really easy to benefit from performance gain. So when OpenAI releases GPT-4, you know, you can instantly switch from your 3.5 implementation to 4 with just a click of the button, right? Or if you want to switch from you know, GPT-4 to Anthropic's Claude model with 100K tokens, you can do that. And so really, the, the goal is to make our platform, and I think this is a good design pattern in general, interoperable with different models underneath. And really, for us, it's about focusing on that embed into data, embed into workflows, make the, the output really usable, and finally, allow useful chaining and comp composability to happen so that all of the above compounds on top of the value of the models that are progressing at a really, really fast rate um, and, and something that you know, really should benefit us rather than feel competitive to us. Um, so uh, the four design patterns, hope they're useful. Um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to reach out, howie at airtable.com. And uh, really excited to see what all of you build, whether it's with no code, code, or something else um, that we haven't thought of yet. But uh, thank you very much for your time, and good to see you all. Thank you.